Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Hey, we are right in the midst of this COVID-19 and coronavirus scare. And over the past month, um, because of that, I've listened to a number of podcast hosts hop on and talk about their take regarding COVID-19 and trying to give information, just to letting people tell their stories. Of course, every business has sent an email to let you know how on top of it they are. And to be honest with you, I'm just almost a little sick about hearing it. But one thing that I have not heard yet is a real firsthand account of actually having the virus, of hearing from a survivor and what that adventure and story was actually like. So today, that is what I'm bringing you. Stay tuned for my interview with Matt Newey, a 23-year-old outdoor photographer, videographer from Centerville, Utah, who on March 19th was Utah's 78th confirmed COVID-19 case. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story Power serves you best when you know how to use it. Matt Newey most likely contracted the virus while on a ski trip to Colorado with four friends. This is Matt's COVID-19 story. First, I want to make Matt a real person. So here's a little bit about him. He is, as I mentioned, a 23-year-old outdoor photographer, videographer, and adventurer. From the time that Matt got his first GoPro camera at the age of 10, he has been videoing himself doing ski backflips, rock climbing, and searching for the perfect landscape photo. In high school, he was shooting one of his many time-lapse shots of the Great Salt Lake, and he realized that his mission is to chase sunsets for a living. He further realized that this was his passion when he went off at 18 on an eight-day solo trip taking pictures of Southern Utah. He's a skier, a son, a brother, and an all-around good kid who contracted COVID-19 and survived. So let's hear his story. Matt, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. (laughs) I'm happy you're here too. So (laughs) you think that you caught COVID-19 on your ski trip. Tell us about that. And we'll start at the beginning of the story. Yeah. So I I got together with uh, four of my good friends um, that are all skiers. And we decided to, you know, make a little ski road trip out to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We left on Friday, March 13th. And during this time, you know, none of the ski resorts were shut down like they are currently. You know, the virus wasn't getting too crazy. Um, There weren't too many like regulations or anything. None of us were, you know, super aware. I mean, it was in the news and stuff, right? And I was making sure to still take precautions, you know, by washing my hands and not touching my face. But, you know, there wasn't any like big, you know, stay at home orders at the time. And so we, you know, we we felt that it was right to go on a a ski road trip uh, to Colorado for the weekend. And while we were there in Colorado, we skied on Friday and Saturday. And then right after we got done skiing on Saturday, they shut down the whole ski resort. And we're like, man, what is happening? This is crazy. And it turned out that like the virus was going rampant in all these, these ski towns in Colorado. And so um, Colorado made a big effort to just shut down all of the ski resorts. And it kind of spread throughout all of the rest of the ski resorts. In Utah, they started shutting down afterwards. And it became this big deal. And so I'm guessing, I'm guessing, Matt, that the reason COVID-19 really shot up in the ski resorts was because you, they had tourists coming in from a lot of different places and bringing Mm -hmm. different germs. And, you know, all you need is a one person that starts that because it's such a social place. But here's the other thing with skiing, you have on gloves and masks, right? It's like the Mm -hmm. one place where you're naturally wearing that anyway. So, Mm -hmm. you know, what were their thoughts about why it spread so quickly there? Yeah, that I think you're exactly right. I think it's because it's a big tourist hotspot. Um, you know, I, while I was skiing, I was on the ski lift. You know, I'd sometimes go in the singles line, right, and hop in with a random person on the ski lift, and I'd be talking to them. And you know, you would talk to people from like all over the country. I talked to one guy, you know, who worked for the government and you know lived in Washington D.C. And you know, he was talking about some friends that he knew that may have had COVID nineteen. After hearing that, I was like, man, this is kind of getting more real because 
you know, during this time, I had knew no one that had the virus. You know, I just thought it was just out of the country or whatever, and it was getting really big in the U.S. But yeah, after, you know, meeting all these other people from all over the world at these ski resorts, it kind of made me realize like, hey, this could be a problem because, you know, th- there's so many different people traveling to this area and they're coming from other hot spots where the virus is. So yeah, you're exactly right. I think it's the biggest problem with these ski resorts is you're just getting tons of people from all over the world. So when they shut it down, did you guys start getting nervous and think, hey, let's pack up and go home? Or was it still kind of three steps removed from you? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Once it shut down, we're like, well, I mean, it was already part of our plans to head home the next day. On Sunday, the 15th is when we decided to drive back home to Utah. So Monday went by and then Tuesday is when I started getting some texts from my buddies. And they asked in this group chat, like, hey, is anybody else feeling really tired and fatigued? I woke up that morning feeling super tired and fatigued and I had body aches. And then we just kind of like wrote it off as like, maybe we just skied really hard over the weekend and our body is just trying to catch up because, you know, we were, we were playing really hard and and we were staying up late. That was, you know, that was all of our guesses like, Hey, maybe we just need to rest up and we'll feel better. That was the first day that most of us felt the first, you know, symptoms of the virus, which makes me think, you know, maybe we did contract it on that trip since all of us were feeling, you know, sick. Right. So one of the things that I think people are most interested in, I'm gauging from my own interest level, is what are the actual symptoms that you feel and the order that you feel them in? And what were they really like? So the first day I started feeling symptoms that morning when we all, you know, woke up feeling tired, I pretty much stayed in bed the entire day. Like I had no motivation to get out of bed. My head was just super foggy. I couldn't focus on anything. My head started to ache too. And my muscles are just super tight and sore. And every time I tried to get up out of bed, uh, I would get really lightheaded and dizzy. It wasn't too extreme that first day. It was just kind of mild. And then um, the second day, I had a regular doctor checkup uh, with my personal doctor. And it wasn't related to how I was feeling because I just thought I was just still sore from my ski trip. He took my temperature and he said I had a fever of 101 degrees. I had no idea I had a fever. I mean, I kind of felt a little flushed, but I just thought it was like warm inside of the doctor's office. And he was like, yeah, you got a fever. We got to get you checked for um, COVID-19. And, you know, that never really crossed my mind just because the symptoms I was experiencing didn't feel like a cold at the time. It just kind of felt like some, you know, fatigue from a hard day of skiing. And so he then took a, you know, a swab, you know, he stuck it up my nose and and, uh, tested me for the flu. And we were hoping it was just a flu bug because that means, you know, I'd be clear of COVID. And 10 minutes later, he came back with that test and he said, I tested negative for the flu. And at that point, my heart started to pound. I was like, oh man, could I have COVID? He took another swab, um, swabbed it up my other nose. And then he said, I will get back to you in 24 to 48 hours. And at this point, he was just like, I want you to quarantine yourself. Tell all your friends to quarantine yourself because there's a possibility that you might have COVID-19. He said, there's about a 5% chance of the people that get tested for COVID-19 that you test positive. And now that may change. Those were the statistics at the time when I got tested. Yeah. So at that point, I was like, oh, yeah, there's no way I have COVID-19 once I heard that. And then, um, you know, 24 hours later, I get a call from my doctor and he told me that I tested positive for COVID-19. I couldn't believe it. You know, my heart just pounded and and I was just like trying to think through my mind, everyone that I've been in contact with. And the first thing I did was like, you know, I called up my friends. I was like, everyone stay home and get tested as soon as you can and quarantine yourselves. You know, I just like went down to my basement, quarantined myself and my family and just try to make any effort I could to stop the spread from happening. worried about honestly were you worried that you might die were you worried that you were going to um, spread it to your family were you worried about all of the people that you'd been in touch with I wasn't too nervous about dying I mean it was there in my mind you know because my symptoms were mild at the time um, but I could feel them kind of changing I was most worried about my parents because you know they're they're older and a little bit more high risk than I am Um, you know I have exercise induced asthma so that made me a little bit nervous And I was also nervous about my friends and how they were handling it and and, um, making sure that they were quarantined. 
Um, but I was more nervous just about, you know, stopping the spread from happening. And, and especially for those who are higher risk, um, like my parents. Yeah. How did, how did you do that? So you, you went down into your basement, you live with your parents and mm-hmm. your parents just stayed upstairs and you just stayed downstairs and who took care of you? Yeah, I stayed in my basement and my, thankfully, you know, I have amazing parents and they would make me meals and then just leave it on the top of the stairs um, for kind of like as if I was, you know, their pet, like a dog <laughs> in their basement. <laughs> and so uh, it, was, it was a really, really funny situation. But um, no, we had it all planned out to where I wasn't um, bringing back any contaminated dishes because they would give me disposable, you know, dishes and plates. And um, we had it all, you know, planned out to where they would bring, you know, delivery of food and then I would take it downstairs and eat it. And then I would just throw it away in the you know trash downstairs. So what and about so the made, air yeah. system though? Because your, a basement of a house is tied in with the same airflow system through the furnace and the AC. Is there any chance of, you know, you breathing and being sick downstairs and it just going through the air ducts? That is a great question. You know, I, I can't answer that. I, I know they were nervous about that with cruise ships and stuff um, when, you know, these cruise ships would get infected and they were worried about the ventilation and the virus being spread that way. Thankfully, you know, my parents never got, you know, the virus while I was sick. So awesome. yeah, that, that, that may be of concern though. I'm not too sure. I mean, there's a lot of research and people are still trying to figure out this virus, but um, yeah, that's a great question. Okay. So as far as your symptoms go, you first went, your first symptoms were this exhaustion and fever and chills and headache, super dizzy when you stand up. And then on the third day, you started getting your sore throat, right? And your lungs going dry and tight. What sort of transpired from there? Yeah. So that's when it started getting really interesting because my lungs just felt really tight. You know, I, I have asthma or exercise induced asthma and I've experienced, you know, asthma attacks before. And it felt like I was having an asthma attack without doing any exercise. You know, I would just be sitting on the couch and all of a sudden I'd just be super winded and it would feel like I'm just breathing really thick air um, as if I was breathing through a straw. You know, I would try to get up to get a glass of water or something and I would just get super lightheaded. I felt like every breath I was taking wasn't absorbing much oxygen, and which is why I would get so lightheaded. Uh, that was probably the scariest time. It really woke me up to the virus. It made me think, man, I can imagine how people are dying from this. You know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't too nervous about my own health, but I, it helped me realize and imagine what those in the hospital who are in critical condition are experiencing, you know, a ventilator or something. It, you know, it just woke me up to the seriousness of this virus for those who are a lot higher risk. And so luckily, you know, my body was able to handle the virus to where I wasn't able to um, be hospitalized, thankfully. So were you ever, like, if your parents left the food at the top of the stairs, you were fine to get up and get out of bed and go get what you needed and, and you could eat and all of that worked fine. You didn't need to have a caretaker that was right by your bed. Correct. Yeah. So thankfully, yeah, I was able to manage myself down here without anybody else coming downstairs and taking care of me, which was uh, very fortunate. I did get very lightheaded and dizzy some of the times when I tried climbing up the stairs to grab the food. And there was a couple of times I kind of had to just kind of crawl up the stairs just so I didn't get dizzy and fall down. But majority of the time, you know, I was able to safely move around to the basement, which was good. When did you get the cough? You know, I was waiting for it the entire week. I was like, man, where's the cough coming? Because, you know, it took a while. But um, yeah, I got the cough on the seventh day. It just hit me like in the middle of the night. You know, I just woke up and I just was super hot and my lungs were tight and aggravated. And I just had this horrible itch in my chest and I could not get rid of it. And I just kept coughing and coughing. And every time I'd cough, it just made my head super dizzy and I was, everything was spinning. Um, it was a rough night. You know, I, I didn't get like much sleep at all. It kept me up all night. And once in the morning had finally come, I started feeling just a little bit better. I, th- I think it was my immune system's just like, you know, final hurrah to like get rid of the virus because my body was just going all out into fighting it because I was just experiencing like everything all at once. It was really strange. So how did it compare to say the worst flu you've ever had? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. It's, it's so, something totally different than a, a normal flu bug, just the, the lungs aspect. I've never had any virus that is made my lungs so tight and feel like I'm having an asthma attack. So that was extremely strange for my experiences with other flu bugs. You know, I've, I've never had anything like that, but it was really weird because instead of having, you know, congestion and a runny nose, I had just really clear 
sinuses, but they were just super dry and they burned like crazy as if I, you know, just ran out in the cold. And you know, when you run out in the cold and your, your whole lungs just feel super dry and they burn and your nose burns. Um, that's, that's exactly what it felt like, even though, you know, I was in a, you know, warm basement. So how miserable was it on the misery scale? I don't know. I mean, I'd probably say like a seven or eight. Um, it wasn't too extreme. Like it wasn't the most extreme sickness. I mean, it may have been the most extreme sickness that I've ever had. I'd probably say that because it was, yeah, I'd probably say it would be just because of the scariness of not being able to breathe. But it wasn't a, too, in my case, it wasn't that painful, thankfully. It was just kind of a lot of, you know, just tiredness and, and a little bit scary, uh, the fact that I couldn't breathe. How did your experience compare with the experiences of your friends? And as you've spoken with other people, do you know other people who have had it? And how did your experience compare to theirs? Of my four friends, after I tested positive, you know, four days later, I was able to get them all tested. And they also tested positive for the virus, which makes me, you know, feel like it was that, that Colorado trip that got us all sick. But, um, but yeah, they, they experienced not as strong as symptoms that I had. They had super mild symptoms and they got over it very quickly. I think it may have been because of my exercise induced asthma. That may be the case of why I reacted differently. Some of them had kind of similar symptoms. Um, another symptom I forgot to mention is uh, I lost my sense of taste and smell. And I still, you know, to this day, you know, it's been over three weeks and I still can't taste or smell. So that's, that's the. Okay. Um, that, that's like crazy. That sucks. That's losing yeah. like two senses. Right. Yeah. That's that's major. Yeah. It's super major. And I've lost my appetite because of it. And, you know, I I can only eat like barely one meal a day. And so I've lost a lot of weight. Uh, I've lost probably over 10 pounds. Shouldn't be a motivation to get the COVID-19 if you're trying to lose weight. But (laughs) The (laughs) new um, weight loss plan. If you live in the beginning. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. But yeah, no, I I really do miss my taste and smell. It's maybe, you know, take it for granted, like, because there's so many things you need it for, uh, smelling whether, you know, food is bad. I left my milk out one time, you know, for like a couple of days and, you know, I tried to smell it and if, see if it was still good, but I have no idea if it's, it's gone bad or not. So that <laughs> but, is um, such a teenage boy thing to do. <laughs> Young adult. I know I, I know. I guess I'll just keep drinking until my stomach hurts or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, okay. Um, when you talk about that and we're sitting here laughing about it and making light of it, but in, truly that's terrifying. Because a sense of taste, I mean, how would it be not to enjoy food anymore? Eating is one of the premier like enjoyments of life, right? Some people, mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the main things you live for is that wonderful opportunity to enjoy food. And to lose your sense of taste means that would be gone. To lose your sense of smell, those are so closely tied together. Is that something right. that's supposed to come back? Yeah. So that's what's really interesting is, you know, I've been doing a bunch of research on this because I'm like, man, when am I going to get my smell and taste back? And I've heard a lot of different stories. I've heard some stories of people getting their sense of taste and smell back. And, you know, back to your question of what similar symptoms are my friends experiencing. So about, I think, two other of my friends experienced the same thing of um, no taste or smell. And I think they're getting their taste and smell back. I think they had a statistic that said two out of three people that you know, contract COVID-19, lose their taste and smell. And so, you know, it's not too rare of a symptom, but um, I've also heard from other friends who have had the flu in the past and have lost their taste and smell. Um, I, I talked to this one lady who said that five years ago, she had this horrible flu bug and lost her taste and smell. And it's been five years now. And she said she's only gotten like 75% of her uh, senses back. And she said that some things don't taste the same. She can't eat bananas anymore because they taste so weird. And Mm -hmm. um, she can't have fruit snacks or anything, any artificial flavoring because it tastes like perfume to her. And so it's it's kind of super interesting. And she said it it, it took her even like just months for her to even be able to smell or taste something. And and then progressively all throughout those five years until present time, she's now gotten 75% of it back. And who knows if it's even going to get better throughout the rest of her life. And so well, could you just eat a lemon damn. and not taste anything? Right. Yeah. That's what was so strange. I, I started doing all these experiments, you know, I was like, man, what, what can I taste? And I, I grabbed a bunch of lemons and I just started eating them like it was nothing. I didn't, 
pucker once. I didn't taste anything. And it was the weirdest thing. It just felt like I was just eating, you know, water inside of this weird, you know, fruit. Hey, the yeah. upside is you can eat super healthy and it was <laughs> and eat I know, stuff right? that tastes bad. You'd be you can just do exact proportions and exact health food and it won't matter how it tastes. hmm I know, right? Exactly. Yeah, except for it, the hard part is just getting the appetite to eat the food in the first place. Right. But uh, oh, I'm but, so um, sorry. No, it's okay. But uh, you're right, though. It, it could. It, you can definitely find a silver lining on it. Yeah, it's, I don't have any desire to eat, drink soda anymore because every time I drink soda, it tastes like carbonated water, and it just it, it's so gross. <laughs> Interesting. So, what advice would you give to the rest of us about? You know, just you've gone through this process about not getting it, about what to do if we do get it. What What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, yeah, just through my experience, just from going on that trip, you know, that just shows how important social distancing is and how important staying home is. Because, you know, even though I was at this ski resort wearing a mask and gloves and everything, you know, I thought I was protected because it's like we're almost in a our own, you know, quarantine, you know, suit or biohazard suit. It may have came, come from the food I was eating there. There's a lot of people there. You know, it's just, you don't know. It could, it could be, you know, somebody coughing and it going airborne and you're breathing in those, you know, droplets. It's just, that's why it's so important to keep that six foot distance um, from other people. Um, just because you don't know where it is. It's invisible and it's it's real. And I think a lot of the time we get comfortable um, as, I, you know, my friends and I did on that that ski road trip thinking, you know, hey, we're invincible. Like, there's no way it's going to get us, you know. And, you know, we weren't hearing too many news things about it being close by. So, you know, we weren't And I was going to say with just yeah. kids your age and, you know, you, you're 23, you're not a kid, but, you know, just <laughs> yeah. my sons are your age. And there's yeah. there's this sense, and I remember being that age, right? And there's there really truly is a sense of invincibility of you're healthy, you're strong, you're in the prime of your life. And because you're not in the category that is most susceptible to COVID-19, there's this Mm -hmm. sense of almost, you know, that there's certainly not as much fear around it. And then you have the, you know, the invincibility of youth that piles on top of that. So what would you say to people your age, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I would, you know, I would say, you know, even though it may not, you may not get hit with the hardest symptoms from it, um, even if you're super healthy, um, we can still be, you know, carriers of the virus and, you know, possibly infect our loved ones, our parents, or even, you know, just those around us. And so we have to be super careful in that case to make sure we're not a vehicle for the virus because, yeah, that's how we stop, you know, that's how we got to stop the spread from happening is just by not giving any more hosts for it to spread around. Yeah, I would just say, you know, follow the CDC guidelines, even if you're not afraid of the virus, because we got to protect our loved ones. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for being here today, for sharing your story. Do you have any final words? Yeah, yeah. It's, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share my experience and story. And I hope it, it uh, brings light and awareness to you know this virus. And I, I hope everyone uh, will take this seriously and, and stay safe and also have hope that we're going to get through this because you know this virus isn't bigger than us. And I, I know life will you know, be back to normal. Thank you. Yeah, stay safe. of stories are being written right now with our choices. Stories of people who are getting COVID-19 and people who are fighting it on the front lines and people who are social distancing and creating really interesting, wonderful memories at home. Um, Maybe some not so wonderful memories. I'm sure everybody's got a different thing going on. There's people who are terrified and they're living as such. And there's people who are in strict quarantine and people who are taking it serious to different degrees. Personally, I feel like this very odd time for us holds a basket of opportunities. Family time, taking stock of our preparedness, time to focus on things around your home that you've put off and to focus on loved ones and relationships and really time to slow down. Time, like Matt has illustrated, where you're on the front lines and you have a story to share in order to help others better understand what is going on. Time to do things that we haven't done in a while. In some ways, I feel like our culture speeding as fast as it speeds, demanding on us as much as it demands that in a way, COVID-19 has served as an equalizer that says, if you guys won't slow down some, I 
will slow you down some, which is a really interesting concept. I encourage all of us to turn to love, to turn to community and to family and sharing to get the most beauty and positive outcome from a time in history that also holds the potential for loss and suffering. Each day, write beautiful things into your story, small and simple things that feel better than fear. Also, it's a great time for families to hop on Amazon and buy my book, Life, Living Intentional and Fearless Every Day, The 21 Life Connection Challenges. And the reason that I say this right now, which I say this in every episode, but the reason right now that it's really coming home is because I've gotten lots of reports of families who are doing the challenges together while they are um, having this family time, more family time. And they're making the most of their social distancing while practicing the fun life skills together that are a part of these challenges. So each morning, the family you know, will read what the challenge is. They'll talk about how they're each going to implement it. And then they go into their day or work on it together since a lot of times they're stuck together. And then you know they talk about it and they learn the skill. For example, challenge number five is giving the benefit of the doubt and teaching a child what that means to give the benefit of the doubt. Maybe a friend texts them and there's a misunderstanding and, you know, and they get to go through that process of learning what it means to believe the best in somebody instead of jumping to a story that is negative or hurtful, believing in good things choosing good stories over difficult ones and teaching the young kids that. And and the book helps you do that with those challenges. So that's something that you can do with your families. I will see you in two weeks on the next episode of the Love Your Story podcast and have a great time um, with your families and at home and creating really interesting spaces that we're not used to. 